You're listening to Men of Abundance, episode 225 with Paresh Shah. Today we're talking about lifting others to heights even they could not imagine, which in turn greatly enhances your own life. Welcome to Men of Abundance, the podcast for those looking to level up their lives by hanging out with some of the greatest leaders and established professionals in our community, living a life of integrity, honor, and the abundance mentality. Prepare to pay it forward with your host, former army medic turned lifestyle entrepreneur, Wally Carmichael. What is going on, Men of Abundance? I am Wally Carmichael, your founder and host of the Men of Abundance podcast. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm super excited that you're here with us today. I have to tell you, of the hundreds of conversations that I've had, this has got to be one of my favorite conversations for so many reasons, because I know without the benefit of a doubt, it is going to make a huge difference impact in your life and greatly enhance your life, especially when you take action on the action steps that Perez shares with you and the action steps that I'm going to share with you at the end of this conversation. And listen, if you're brand new to Men of Abundance, I want to welcome you. And if you've been here for a while and listening, I thank you so, so much for all of you. Be abundant in your life today. Pay it forward and share Men of Abundance with others. We are getting so many more downloads recently. I don't know where they're coming from, but some of you, it has to be because some of you are sharing men of abundance with your circles, and I greatly appreciate that. Also, if you're digging what you're hearing here on Men of Abundance, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and review. And if you do leave a review, I would ask you this one thing. Just use the word abundance in your comments somewhere, somehow. Listen, I'm no techie. I don't know for a fact that that will raise up the search engines as people search for abundance on iTunes, but I have a pretty good idea that it will, if abundance is in the comments, then it will further lift up men of abundance in the search engines. So when people are searching for abundance, then men of abundance will pop up because what I'm seeing is when I search for abundance in iTunes, I'm seeing a lot of shows popping up that have nothing to do with abundance at all. But somehow when you search abundance, they are the first five that pops up and good for them. That's awesome for them. But the thing is, is when people are searching for abundance, they're looking for conversations like this. So help them out. Leave a rating and review on iTunes and use the word abundance somewhere in your review. I greatly appreciate that and so will others. Now, one of my favorite activities to do throughout my day is to lift up others. It's much of what I do right here on Men of Abundance is I'm lifting up all of these amazing guests and people that we're talking to and lifting them up and lifting up their message. I love to celebrate the wins of others. I love to lift the spirits of those who are down. And I love to see people grow in their family, faith, finances, and fitness. Today's conversation is all about being a leader who lifts others to heights even they cannot imagine. Today's conversation is with a lifter leader like no one I have ever had the pleasure to talk to to date. When you take action on today's action steps, you have a very strong chance of greatly enhancing your life as well as those around you. Our featured guest today, Press Shaw, is a positive force around everyone he meets. He has a unique ability to connect with people of all levels, cultures, and ages, creating connections that inspire people to think bigger and achieve more. Press is a unique combination of technology engineer, Harvard MBA, strategist, innovation trainer, successful entrepreneur, and trained yogi. His abilities to cross multiple worlds have made him a sought-after motivational speaker, workshop facilitator, business strategy consultant, non-obvious innovator, and advisor to senior executives, entrepreneurs, and celebrities. Men of Abundance, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Paresh Shah. Paresh, welcome to Men of Abundance, man. How are you doing? I am abundant. I am blessed. I'm a blessed, abundant, and so happy to be with you, Wally. Outstanding. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually excited to uh, have this conversation with you as we were talking pre-show. I mean, we just got some of them. This is going to be an amazing conversation. I just know without a doubt because we've already connected. <laughs> Where are you at in the world? Where am I physically? Mm-hmm. Physically, I'm a block from the beach, Manhattan Beach. I'm overlooking Palos Verdes to my left as far as I can see, Malibu to my right. I see surfers in the water, sailboats, and um, my kids are downstairs. We're going on vacation for two days before school starts. We have four kids, all home 
which is a miracle at the same time. And um, I'm just looking at life saying, wow, how did this happen? And um, I do know how it happened, and it relates a lot to what you and your audience uh, believe in, practice, and reaffirm for one another, uh, which is uh, a set of mindsets and way of being, way of thinking, way, way of um, acting in the world that has created this, which I never believed in before. And that's been part of the fun of this journey of life is like, wow, I'm like the luckiest guy on earth. I've got a beautiful wife. We've been married for 30 years, four children. I get to do what I want. I've been in 30, 40 countries. I work with leaders around the world um, and I have fun. So, hey, that's where I am right now. And uh, that's what anyone, where anyone can be, believe it or not. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with all of that. I was, I don't know that I was a non-believer. I just wasn't a practicer of everything that we're talking about here at Men of Abundance and totally get it. I got to say, I, I envy you. I missed, I do miss the, uh, having that looking out the front window and actually from my bathroom uh, of the yeah. ocean and seeing surfers <laughs> you know, and seeing the You were in Hawaii, beach. right? Yeah. You were living, where in Hawaii were you living? I was, I've lived all over Hawaii, but one of my favorite places I lived was on the beach and on the west side of Oahu. Uh, oh, it was called Eva Beach and literally right on the beach. I mean, my front yard was the beach. It was amazing. But, you know, it was time to change scenery after 10 years in Hawaii. It, we just wanted a change of scenery and get closer to my wife's home, which is Panama, Central America. And quite frankly, I wanted to get closer to Disney World. I'm a, I'm a Disney freak and I love theme parks. So, <laughs> Oh, so do I. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So I'm in Tampa and, and it's, by, it's on purpose. You know what? One of the things that we uh, we train and teach when we are uh, working with clients on being uh, innovators and disruptors is the importance of playfulness and that childlike beginner's mind, the imagination, the no cynicism, and just sort of you know dropping in and you know before you know it, having Mickey Mouse ears singing. It's a small world after all. Mm -hmm. That way of being, that that joy like playfulness is so powerful in order to innovate great products, services, mm -hmm. experiences, etc. So I really honor that fact that you've, uh, you know, kind of moved towards what, what delights you, what brings you joy, because it's very important that we have joy in order to succeed. And I didn't really believe that decades ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, one of my highlights of one of the most amazing people I had a conversation with, not just for the show, but just in life, was uh, Lee Cockerell, who used to be the, uh, he's the former uh, senior vice president of operations for Disney World Resorts, and he was there for like uh -huh. 10 years. It's amazing how they how Disney pulls all of that together, everything from the onboarding, even before they onboard, even before anybody even applies, they, they make them watch a video to say, this is who we are, this is what we expect, and it weeds out most people. <laughs> Quite frankly, according That's to what Lisa says. So, the, um, and you know, you and I both being in business and business strategies, we know that hiring the right people the right way is paramount to a business. And then having you know having them come to work, we realize everybody's got issues, everybody's got problems, and we are sympathy, sympath we sympathize with that. But when you come to work, especially a place like Disney, and it should be anywhere, Disney teaches. People, even the military, uh, Lee Cockrell specifically has taught, had seminars with generals uh, to teach them specifically how in our medical centers, how to interact with patients and how to interact with customers and stuff. So the whole process mm -hmm. just fascinates me. I, I just love It's it. really beautiful. I mean, you, it's an interesting point. Like if you were to be a character, Wally, who would you be? Would you be Mickey, Goofy, Donald? Mm. Uh, who would you be? That's it. man. That's a very good question. I sometimes, uh, you know, I th sometimes I think I'm grumpy because <laughs> I can be. Um, but I, in fact, I have a shirt that says um, "Genius by birth, grumpy by choice." Um, that my <laughs> wife got me. But um, but no, I mean, or maybe happy. I don't know. I, I just probably I one think of you'd the seven happy. dwarfs. I think, I think I'd be happy, happy for sure. I'm not always or maybe happy. You'd be but... the, maybe you'd be the eighth dwarf called Abundance. <laughs> I think you know, so. There happy, we go. Let's just do that. Let's create that eighth yeah. dwarf. But what you make, the make you make a great point, which is, for instance, um, I would probably be like the Merlin version of Mickey Mouse mm -hmm. if I were oh, yeah. uh, in in character. That's I would be the Merlin. Uh, and, you know, people like Paresh, you're kind of like, you know, the magical or whatever. Um, and it brings a great point. Even if you had a crappy day, you know, sitting in L.A. traffic and people are being whatever and our politicians are doing whatever. When you put on that, when I put on that Merlin, Mickey Mouse, 
costume, um, I need to leave that all behind because there are children there. There are parents there. There are mm-hmm. people who may have just been divorced, who, you know, had have a week with their kids. And you got to show up and you got to leave that other stuff mm-hmm in the dressing room and that's what we talk about with our leaders is you know how do we you know show up in life uh for our workers for our customers um and um you know show them the magic even though we may not feel it yeah absolutely because then it grows on you and and you get it right back like a boomerang and then it comes back and then you feel like you're you're happy and dancing and Mm -hmm. how did that happen you put it out there yeah, absolutely, man. And listen, guys, this isn't just for Disney. This is for your business. If you're a business owner, if you're an employee, pay, you know, patrons don't come into wherever you work to hear your problems. They're coming in there for a reason, and that reason is for whatever product or service that you guys sell. I don't want to make this into a big old you know, business conversation, but the fact of the matter is it's true at home as well. You know, no doubt. We have issues at home, and your kids – Rather you believe it or not or know it or not, they know everything that's going on between you and your spouse. Everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I assure you, I, we were driving one time, for instance. We're driving down the street, my wife and I having a conversation. And hey, I forget what it was, but my son's in the back seat on his, I think it was on his Kindle or something like that, watching a movie. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. like six or seven. And he goes, he re- repeats one of the big words that we used. And he said, what does that word mean? And we're like, where the hell, where'd that come from? He's just not even paying attention. He's paying, they're paying attention. So all of this stuff that we're talking about, about, you know, getting your mind right, um, showing up in the way that you want people to, you know, you just need to show up and you need to show up in the right way. Uh, And that's true at work and business and at home. So, you know, we've already gotten quite a bit into the conversation and I'll bet I know the answer to this question, but I want to ask you specifically, what do you have to be grateful for today, Paresh? Okay. I, I'm grateful that I understand the power of gratitude. First of all, I thought it was just a, you know, touchy feely hippie, you know, gorper crystal loving, you know, sort of thing about gratitude. It's powerful. It is technology. Just like Elon Musk is building technology, just like you know, Google has technology. Gratitude is technology. And so what I'm grateful for today is being alive at this time where literally a new world is being created, where there's a massive global awakening happening now, now, as we speak. It wasn't happening 20, 30 years ago. I'm so glad to be alive where we can have these conversations and um, wisdom has been unleashed. The fact that we're talking about abundance and, you know, uh, the lack of poverty consciousness anymore and pay it forward and the power of gratitude uh, and servant leadership and uh, authenticity and the things that we talk about when, um, you know, we train people in what we call lifter leadership. And that's my forthcoming book. Uh, think about it. Wisdom has been unleashed in our lifetime. We can go to the Internet um, and, you know, pull up things from Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra, Law of Attraction, mantras that bring us prosperity, practices uh, to overcome our, you know, stories that keep us uh, from our worthiness. And it's unlimited. Before it used to be, you know, hidden. You'd have to be a monk in a, you know, in a cave. You'd have to be cloistered. And a lot of these teachings were hidden, obscured, or inaccessible. And so what I'm grateful for is Today, if I had a question about, I don't know, you know, some teachings from, uh, you know, some ancient culture, I can just within a minute be immersed in it and I don't need to, you know, search the world. Uh, I was reading some things about Buddha um, and, you know, his life journey. And, uh, you know, he left his home when he was 29 and his father pretty much was protecting him because he wanted to be, you know, king and and, you know, the heir to, you know, uh, royalty. And he he hid him from the poverty and the suffering of, of humans. And so he left home at 29 and started his journey and he got his awakening around 30 when he was about 35. And he had to go through a bunch of things like one of his uh, experiments was with um um, uh, ascetism where he was, you know, basically denying his body for years and going, well, maybe the way to enlightenment 
and joy and flourishing is to starve and hang upside down in a tree and, you know, uh, deny the body and, and don't worry about pain. And then years and years he did this. And then after some point he goes, ah, actually, I don't think that's it. Maybe I should eat. <laughs> Maybe I should eat and meditate. We don't need to do that experiment of years and years and years and find a teacher and then realize, ah, that's not the one. Let's, you know, get our backpack on and, you know, be like, you know, David Carradine and Kung Fu and go wander <laughs> to some other um, teacher. We have the world of teachings right in front of us. Truth is right there and we can just access it. So. I am grateful to be alive today in this time with people like you who get it, and we have not only the wisdom of it, but we're able to actually create um, a community to reinforce and support and affirm uh, what really is truth. We can witness it, share it, affirm what really works, because I know my greatest weakness and most humans' greatest weaknesses is I teach wisdom, meditation, and, and mindful leadership is – we as humans, we forget that the truth is right in front of us. So that's what I'm grateful for is you can remind me of the truth. I can remind you of the truth. And if we have any doubts, we just pull up Google and then Google can go, hey, by the way, if you forgot the truth, here's how it works. Here's some videos. Here's some teachings. Here's some books. And we, can, we, we basically have a Whitman sampler of spirituality right at our fingertips, which no generation ever had before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's literally in the palm of our hands, and I love it. Absolutely love it. And I love the fact that, you know, when you talk about stuff like this podcast, for instance, it's downloaded in, of all places, 63 countries, I'll check, something like that, in China. People yeah. in China have downloaded this show somehow or another, and I can track that. I can see that. It's just amazing that people are able to hear my voice and hear our conversations and just lift people up that way. How yep. would you describe yourself? You already described it in our pre-conversation. You call me an F R E A K, and I'm very proudly, you know, will will accept that. <laughs> I am I am a freak. Um, how would I describe myself? <sighs> Unless you can see the intersections of what I do, one would say I'm a highly disjointed, unfocused person. However, if you see it from another perspective, then you will see that I'm a highly integrated. Um, person who has pulled together a variety of disciplines and um, areas of expertise in a unique way that I'm really excited about and that align with who I am and what my mission in life is. So uh, I describe myself as an aerospace engineer, very practical, logical, analytical. You know, I typically didn't buy into a lot of the touchy feely stuff from that. Um, mindset. Then I uh, turned into a Harvard MBA, so I didn't know much about business, and so I became a business um, a junkie, and uh, somehow I became uh, an expert uh, in strategy, leadership, innovation, uh, and business organization, uh, which has been great because I love helping companies. Uh, and then uh, recently, uh, in the past mm, seven, eight years, I've um, uh, become a consciousness uh, wisdom junkie. Uh, so I've become a yoga instructor here in LA and around the world. I teach wisdom, uh, the metaphysics of, you know, how do we manifest, you know, uh, uh, joy and uh, prosperity. So um, I describe myself as a junkie for happiness, consciousness and human flourishing uh, in organizations, whether they be startups, companies, nonprofits, governments, within families, within schools. Um, and uh, what I think really has been fun is I'm an intersection seeker and an in intersection thinker and an intersection teacher, uh, seeker, thinker, te teacher. And when we bring different worlds together, it's at the intersection of the different worlds between, hey, business and mindfulness and gratitude and, um, you know, uh, problem solving. That's where the magic happens. So I'm a magic maker at the intersection of Leadership, mindfulness, business, technology, um, playfulness. I play heavy metal guitar, so you can throw in, you know, hair band, metal, and somehow it comes together in a way that resonates uh, when we teach uh, lifter leadership, when we teach innovation, um, when I'm coaching CEOs, uh, and I just have the greatest job. I, you know, basically, you know, people pay me to help them, and what's so great is when you help a CEO. Um, 
you know, really step into uh, his or her power um, and help them realign how they think about business leadership, which is fundamentally shifted in the past couple of years. And that's why this lifter leadership model um, basically outlines for people. Uh, you're actually creating jobs. You're helping families flourish. You're helping suppliers flourish. So to me, it's the greatest gift you can give is helping organizations thrive and flourish, treat their people well, expand and grow so that we can keep the ripple going. Wow, very impressive. Very impressive. So all of this happiness and, and joyfulness and abundance and all everything you're talking about here, one would actually think that Paresh has never had a down moment, has never had a kick in the gut moment. And I'm pretty sure that's not true just based on my experience. <laughs> so if you would share with us uh, one of those kick in the gut moments, man, and really make us feel that. Um, I actually did not have a kick in the gut moment until um, very late in my career, in all honesty. Life has been great for me. I've been blessed with, you know, brains and hard work, and my mom and dad really taught me a lot. Um, and so I really didn't have a lot of super kick in the gut moments, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, in the Joseph Campbell journey, you know, they, they talk about that, you know, that night of darkness in your life, which then wakes you up. And so for me, uh, that kick in the gut moment that began to wake me up into the types of conversations you and I are having, which I never would have had before this kick in the gut moment, uh, was um, uh, back in around 2011, um, well, actually, I had started a company. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I actually have several operating companies as well as uh, the, the training, coaching, uh, workshops that we do uh, at the non-obvious company, which is the, the, the comp one of the companies I run. And uh, we co-founded a company. I co-founded a company with uh, four other um, friends slash entrepreneurs in 2015. Uh, it was a big idea, uh, and we invested a ton of our time and money uh, into cultivating this idea. Very risky, uh, very high potential, and could make a big difference. And um, uh, lo and behold, between 2015 and 2000, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 2005, we started the company. I rewind. I'm sorry. 2005, we started this company, and in 2011. The company became worth five billion dollars. Wow. Okay, so that was great because I wanted to make money, right? We talk about money, uh, abundance, etc. To me, it was about making money back then, and so we were able to create something amazing. And then, kick in the gut moment, drum roll, please, was this was in partnership with the government, and it became worth so much money that the government that we were partners with pretty much said, we'll take that. Thank you very much. Bye bye or else. Wow. And those two little words or else, I'm not saying that they explicitly said or else, but we could read the tea leaves. Mm -hmm. Those little words or else changed my life. Cause I was asking my friends who had worked in this country more than I had. I grew up in America. What do they mean by or else? <laughs> and my <laughs> friend said, dude, you don't understand. When a government says, get out, shut up, this is ours, or else, hmm. you hear the sirens in the yeah, back? Yeah, that, that that's kind right of, on time. Right on time. <laughs> okay? It's not what you think it is means. And so what happened was um, it really threw me off. So uh, we we actually didn't uh, leave this situation, even though we were encouraged to leave this uh, country where we had started this uh, company. I was living in France, in Paris at the time with my four children and wife. And we had a company here in the US and a company uh, in this other country. And um, it really threw me off. I had never been in a place of fear such as that before. Uncertainty. They basically, you know, taking something that we had worked very hard on and basically it was gone. It was taken from us and I was angry. Um, I There was a lot of blame. Um, 
I, I felt fear because of this or else. What does that really mean? Um, and um, really just knocked me out, knocked me out, knocked me out. I thought I had my bleep together. I thought I had it together. And I'm just, you know, I'm a entrepreneur. I'm a business guy building a business. And then that happened. And literally it threw me into a tail spin. Uh, you know how like um, Maverick and Goose – in Top Gun had that flat spin mm -hmm. where the airplane just kind of started spinning and they couldn't get out of the flat spin. That is what I felt like. And it was a real, real um, pivot point, I think is what you would call it. Yeah. So let's talk about that pivot point. What did, what did you learn from that? And where did you take it from that point? So I realized I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. And I have a resume that my parents are extremely proud of. Uh, um, you know, it's whatever, uh, academically, et cetera, I've been gifted. And I thought, you know, I had my act together. Everything is good. I'm chugging away, building businesses, you know, accumulating, you know, uh, money and wealth and creating good things for people. Um, and I wasn't a jerk. I'm a nice guy. I always have been. Um, but I didn't realize there was uh, more to it than, you know, just me and my, you know, what I'm creating, you know, for me and my family and my team, there's, there's way more to it, which is what you are all about, Wally. So what happened was, um, I, uh, left, um, by the way, a parenthesis on this one is we actually sued the government and we won a billion dollars. And now we are trying, now we're, now we're working to collect that. And so that's a process. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, the, the enough is enough moment was I went back to, um, Paris when my family and I were living again, another dream that you go, how the heck did this guy end up living in Paris for four years with his four children and wife? Because all dreams can come true when we live a life of abundance and, and awareness and, and giving this. So what happened was, um, I went back to Paris um, with my tail between my, my, uh, whatever, my, my legs and just going, what the bleep just happened. If I'm so bleeping smart and such a great business builder, business t trainer, business coach, etc., entrepreneur, what the bleep just happened here. And I really was basically, um, paralyzed. Uh, out of control. A lot of uh, men in particular, we need, we feel like we need control. Control is a very important programming that we have. And I was out of control. Everything was out of control. It's a, and I felt like the airplane was just spinning and spinning and spinning in a flat spin. And how do we get out of it without hitting the eject button and then, you know, maybe ending up in the ocean? So what happened, believe it or not, you, <laughs> is now I did not believe in a greater power at that point, Wally, I, I think you always, you know, have, um, I was very much about me and somehow, um, you know, the universe, spirit, God, whatever we want to call the greaterness of the higher power of life in the universe got through to me. Um, kind of like, remember that, the, uh, there was a whole Bill Cosby thing a while back before he was funny and before he became, you know, this evil guy where, um, he's playing Noah and Noah has God, you know, speak to him while he's in the in the carpentry shed. And he's like, Noah. And he's like, who's that? Noah. This is God. Oh, is that right? <laughs> I want you to build an ark. You want me to build an ark? And so he's having this conversation with God in this comedy sketch. It is actually quite funny. If we forget everything Bill Cosby has re recently been through, he was very funny back then. And so um, I'm having this kind of conversation with, you know, the universe, and I didn't even believe in it, which is really hilarious. And somehow the universe got through to me that the only way out of this flat spin and feeling I, that life was out of control was to do something impossible that was the only way and somehow that message got through to me from god before i believed in such things and do you know what so i was like great do you want me to try go climb a mountain you know i've climbed mountains before do i need to you know run a marathon um you know do i need to and you know what the answer was wally of all things the answer to this is what you need to do Paresh. 
that's impossible that will get you out of your situation. Do you know what it was, Wally? <laughs> I can't even imagine, man. <laughs> I couldn't either. Do you know that that um, workout routine called P90X with Tony Horton that they have late on late night TV? I know it very well. <laughs> okay. So, believe it or not, you know how the universe clobbers you with a message from all sides? Like, literally, like, you know, strangers and beggars on the street will be like, hello, sir, could you spare a dime? And you should do P90X. You know how strangers mm-hmm. as angels pretty much deliver what you need to do next in your journey. I was getting clobbered from all sides saying, Paresh, for you, P90X is the impossible. You've always been a brainy little Indian guy, um, and you've never like pushed yourself that hard. And to me, the impossible was being ripped and built like you know Tony Horton and some of those people on those mm-hmm. commercials. That was that to me was the impossible thing because I used to play wimpy sports when I was a kid. I'd do tennis and swimming, but I never really, you know, demanded myself to t- go beyond what I felt I could do, you know, really hard. So um, I pulled up the, I got these, uh, I got the DVDs shipped over to Paris, and there I am in my living room doing Tony Horton, you know, and he's got all his uh, Drea, he's got all his friends, and and my kids are making fun of, you know. Tony and the gang because I'm, you know, interacting with them on TV for, you know, months and months. And I actually did it. I did it. And I became ripped and buff, which for me was impossible. And what was cool was I had that moment as I was debating whether to do this or not. And the voice, to the extent it's a voice, I'm not saying it was a voice like, you know, Bill Cosby heard, but basically the discernment came through that said, Paresh, this is your moment. This is what you need to do, and if you don't do this now, just shut up about ever being in shape. Shut up when your kids have kids and you cannot run with your grandkids and you're on the sidelines. This is your moment to change that. You need to do this, and if you don't do this now, just be done with it. Don't ever say you're going to get in shape and all that. And I was like, wow, this is powerful. So I did it. I became ripped. I became powerful. And I really got into my body like I've never done before in terms of just at one in the morning. I'd come home from a meeting or something. I'd put those DVDs in and I would do it because I, I had to do it. And I was never so obsessed. Uh, my kids saw, you know, a maniac actually. And and it worked. And my wife and kids were watching me throughout this process, you know, and there's all kinds of jokes and mocking of dad because that's our role as dads. And my wife's like, wow, that works. So she started doing it. And I did the impossible, Wally. I did the impossible. And you know what's cool? Once you do the impossible, nothing is impossible. <laughs> Imagine that. Once you do the impossible, once, nothing is impossible. And so that created a great opening. So what happened was my wife was watching me and you know she's like, hmm, you're looking pretty good. So she started doing it. And then guess who showed up knocking on my door? Doubting Thomas. Doubting oh, Thomas, the voice, yeah. showed up and said, hey, Paresh, remember that impossible thing that you just did that you're so proud of? I'm like, yeah, man, I rocked it. I rocked it. I did the impossible. Look at my before after. I am ripped. I am the Indian brainiac who is now ripped. And Doubting Thomas said, maybe that was a fluke, Paresh. And I'm like, no, it wasn't, man. I put my heart into this. I, I sweat, man. I, I did this. Maybe it was a fluke, Paresh. I was like, screw you. I'm going to do this again. So I started doing it again as my wife was doing it. And I started getting uh, very strong for my for my own you know sake, and my wrists were very weak, and so I hurt my wrists because the weights were getting so strong, and I hurt them pretty bad, so I couldn't lift weights anymore. And finally, I'd gotten into my body for a change, and I was like, "Wow, this is really cool. Maybe I should do something else that's physical while my um, uh, wrist heal. So, uh, I thought, well, maybe I'll do some yoga. And my wife and I did some yoga over the years when we went on vacation, we'd go to a resort or, you know, take some classes here or there, but nothing formal. Um, so I ordered some DVDs, uh, from America to France where we had our, you know, American DVD player. And I started doing yoga. Um, I started doing what's called Kundalini yoga, uh, in my living room. And, um, it changed my life and I started be- getting powerful 
really powerful. I became fearless. I started having powers of things like telepathy and just knowing things. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. This is a technology. And so then I um, just threw myself into yoga, meditation, spirituality, self-help, um, and you know, just went around the world. I was basically like a monk for about a year. You know, I went to uh, Catholic school as a kid. I said, let me kind of take a look at that stuff again because I kind of dismissed it when I was a kid. And I asked my parents about the Indian traditions and Hinduism and Jainism, which is their tradition. Um, I spent a week with Thich Nhat Hanh at his uh, at his monastery. Uh, actually, this is how hilarious our family is. Where we went, our spring break vacation. I said, hey, guys, let's go to Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery and hang out with him and the monks. And we did. <laughs> and it was great. And the kids loved it. So I became a spiritual uh, – I basically immersed, immersed in consciousness, gratitude, positivity, pay it forward, um, the spirituality of everything. And so that was my enough is enough moment was – Tony Horton showed up in my life and activated a certain part of me, which then got me into yoga, meditation, mindfulness, manifestation, and how do we be powerful as beings to create a world where we can individually and collectively flourish. And that's what I'm all about, and that's what my Lifter Leadership book, which is forthcoming, uh, is about. It's um, kind of like the seven habits of of, of effective people, Stephen Covey's great work for today's times where people understand, um, you know, it's about authenticity and integrity and positivity and purpose and uh, helping people be creatively self-expressed and making a difference. So, so there you go. That was my enough is enough moment. And I ended up becoming a P90X <laughs> freak and a yoga uh, maniac. And now I, I have yoga classes I teach uh, around the world. I have students. And there's nothing like being a teacher because it's the best way to learn. Because when we teach, we need to have integrity in our word. And what we teach our students around what life is and how it works, then we must do our best to practice it. So it's the greatest gift. Man, absolutely. I'm sitting here with just a huge smile on my face because it just it's just so surreal. Everything you're saying right now and all of the stuff. Now, I didn't have a billion dollar company and all this other kind of stuff. But um, another individual came into my life, which I had n didn't even know anything about this guy. And it was Sean T with insanity. Yeah. And then next thing I know, I'm freaking ripped and I'm an insanity instructor and I'm and I'm leading, you know, group training. And and like you said, the best the thing that I loved about training so much was it kept me accountable. Um, exactly. And then I learned more and I learned more and I, everything. So the whole thing, even what you said about the best way to hone your skill and learn more is to teach. That's why I love doing this. I love teaching. Teaching and healing. When we teach and heal, we teach and heal ourselves. It's Absolutely. pretty much how it works. It is. It is. And it's just if you're not teaching, if you're not giving, if you're not paying it forward, then in my mind, you're basically staying stagnant and at worst moving backwards. Backwards. Because everybody exactly. else is moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's happening is we need to be we need to advance ourselves forward um, almost to stay in place because there's so much collective unconscious um, energy and, and pressure on us through the messages we receive from the media, through the way people are speaking with one another, and just energetically, because it's all energy. You know that. I know that. Mm -hmm. Your audience knows that. Again, I'm an engineer. I studied physics. I love quantum physics. To me, everything we're talking about in terms of karma, pay it forward, generosity, gratitude, it's all an energy play. We are all energy beings. We are not distinct from one another. It's a big field of energy. It looks like we're separate. It's just atoms and molecules vibrating down to a, a tiny little vibration and it's a big energy field and when we play in that field um it's 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 beautiful and the, what we're seeing is quantum physics science uh, neuroscience the science of happiness is now colliding with self-help it's colliding with spirituality it's combining with all kinds of other realms and it's again it's a beautiful time where we can reconcile these things and say why gratitude well gratitude is a higher frequency way of being and when we express feel uh, and immerse ourselves in gratitude we're elevating our frequency just like we're you know cranking up uh, our amplifier I've got a Marshall stack with my Gibson Les Paul custom and you're cranking it up to 11 and basically it drowns out negativity anger apathy despair and it actually lifts thousands of people around us subtly um, and energetically so to me it's it's all the same 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we were talking pre-show and you brought it up a couple times. And I really want to, I'm just very interested in finding out more about this uh, lifter leadership. You're talking about the riff and the whole bit. Walk us through that. Where did that all come from? And who's the audience for that? And what does that do for them? Uh, You bet. So I was uh, in my freakishness uh, looking to reconcile this newfound love that I had. So my loves were engineering, solving things, technology. I've built several technology companies. Then my love is business, right? How do we flourish in business, have great organizations, and how do we address you know, the big issues that companies have? Because I was working a lot with clients on you know, strategy. How do you have a, a, a sustainable strategy? How do you be innovators? How do you be great leaders? How do you engage workers? Because as you know, seven out of 10 workers today in America are what we call disengaged. In other words, they don't give a bleep. They don't care. Um, and that think of the productivity loss. I'm sure all of your uh, listeners have seen that where workers uh, are not fully engaged. They're not giving it your all. Uh, and uh, consumers only trust 55% of companies today. So there's a huge trust and believability gap. So I had been working in these domains, coming at it from the rational Harvard MBA side with clients, large and small. And then this new world erupted, literally erupted into my life in 2011, 12, around what you're all about. And I basically went on a, 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 I don't know what you would call it. It was like a rocket, rocket ship ride. And so I was looking to figure out how do we, how do I reconcile these two things? On the one hand, I'm a yogi. I'm talking about positivity and authenticity and love and gratitude and pay it forward. In, in when I uh, coach CEOs, I coach celebrities on how to be super powerful. Uh, and then I've got the business stuff. And I was trying to figure out how do I reconcile the two and then again, through the grace of the universe, this framework of lifter leadership emerged. And so lifter leadership um, is an amazingly powerful paradigm to bring this all together in a way that you don't feel like you're living in two worlds. Because some people, they go to work and they live in one world where it's like, you got to be aggressive and, you know, it's about me and it's about competition and, you know, I got to get my share. And, you know, one of the the things we talk about in my TEDx talk, which I invite all of your folks, uh, if they like more, to come to IamALifter.com backslash MOA, Men of Abundance. Um, check out my TEDx talk, and we've got some goodies for you as well, a diagnostic to see you know, what kind of lifter you are. So basically what we realized, for instance, Wally, is what I learned at Harvard Business School was to be very effective at hunting for customers, targeting them, capturing them, segmenting them, analyzing them, and then having my share so no one else could have it. Okay, and that's been the prevailing mindset of business is like, you know, we capture customers, we hunt them. And it's a very transactional predator, prey, victim, victor, um, uh, win, lose mindset. And in the lifter leadership model, we've actually, through our research over the past four or five years, developed four specific mind shifts that if you get these mind shifts, you will be the leaders of the future. And our research has shown, and I've given this talk, you know, you talk about people all over the world resonating with your message. I've given my lifter leadership keynote workshops, training, um, of course, across America, South by Southwest, Wisdom 2.0, uh, Junior Achievement, in China to a 1,000 Chinese executives, in Kuwait to the Kuwaiti government, in Brazil. It's a universal message. And so, for instance, the first mind shift we call in the lifter leadership uh, paradigm uh, in the training we do, we say the hunt is over is the new mind shift. So it used to be we hunt, target, capture customers. Now, lifters, which are people like you and me and your audience, understand it's not about hunting, capturing, taking, you know, getting as much share of wallet. No, lifters understand you don't need to hunt, target, capture customers. That's an old, outdated mindset that is transforming under our noses. Lifters understand you don't need to hunt, target, capture customers. No, lifters help customers. We inspire them. We serve them, we lift them, and we attract them. And it's a whole different mindset. So we teach people how to have these mind shifts 
and where are specific skills we can employ to be aware of these mind shifts and move into this new paradigm. So the first mind shift, we say the hunt is over. That whole hunt model is outdated. And Wally, do you want to hear a big misunderstanding that we found in our research that will blow your mind? Absolutely. Okay, so if I were to say to you, what did Charles Darwin, or you and your audience, what did Charles Darwin teach the world? What were some words that would come to mind? Charles Darwin. Oh, man, now I'm drawing a blank. Survi- survival <laughs> the, of, of the, the fittest. fittest, right? Natural selection, mm-hmm. dog eat dog. So what happened was Charles Darwin in the late 1800s, you know, uh, was was a rock star on the planet, and he and he did all this research, and he came out with his thesis. Uh, it was an 880-page thesis called "The Descent of Man," um, around what do humans need in order to flourish, be happy, progress as civilization, uh, and elevate ourselves to higher order uh, beingness as human beings, and so. In his 880-page thesis that the world basically, you know, adopted carte blanche and were like, dog eat dog, man, survival the fittest, you know, winner take all. That's been the mindset that you are here to undo with your audience, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what Men of Abundance is about. Um, and it, and typically it was the men who were the hunters, right? It's like my job is to go out there and kill something and bring it home for my people. And if I don't kill it, someone else is going to, and then we might starve. So this whole you know survival poverty thing. Well, guess what, Wally? This will blow your mind. In Charles Darwin's research, do you know how often out of his 880 pages thesis he used the word survival of the fittest? Yes. Probably zero. Two. Okay, wow. Comp- competition. Do you know how often he used the word competition, which is the antithesis to abundance, as you know? Yeah. Twelve, 12 times. Wow. Okay. Do you know how often he used the word mutuality and cooperation as it pertains to human progression and evolution and survival? Twenty-four times. Mm. And guess what word Charles Darwin used 96 times to describe what humans need in order to survive, progress, elevate, and um, you know take humanity to a whole new level. Guess what word he used ninety six times, Wally? We'll give you. We'll give you. The, close. He's used that twenty four times. Mm. Starts with L. O. V. E. Love. 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 So if we were to ask people all around the world, and I've done this in in probably 10, 15 countries as we've been teaching lifter leadership to executives, to governments, they're like, oh my God, this is what we need, Mr. Shaw. This answers our question for what's wrong and what's broken in leadership and how we address the need for innovation, worker engagement, building trust and loyalty with customers, being socially responsible. Love, love. And around the world, I say, what did Charles Darwin teach us? And, you know, I've got kids I uh, give keynotes to in in schools. They're like, you know, survival of the fittest. I'm like, yeah, the world believes the model of lack of abundance, scarcity, has been the model. And you go, wait a minute, how did this happen? How come no one says the word love? Because Darwin said it 96 times, and he only used that survival of the fittest thing twice. And what happened as we researched it a bit more was that Charles Darwin, um, basically he was a scientist. Like he would go, he'd wake up in the morning, get his coffee and basically go stare at the turtles for like six or seven hours. That's what, you know, brought him joy. Let's draw some pictures of some flowers and stare at the turtles and the salamanders down at the Galapagos Islands. He had some other researchers on his team, and one of them was a guy named Huxley, Thomas Huxley, not Aldous Huxley. And uh, his reputation, his his name, they called him the Bulldog, and he was like a junior researcher with Charles Darwin. So the way I put the pieces together is Darwin was the rock star and the genius. Huxley was his PR agent. Huxley was the guy who basically went around the world and was like, hey, my man Charles Darwin has got a breakthrough for humanity. It's called survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog. You've got to take care of yourself or you will die. 
the only the strong survive, so you got to crush the little guy. So the world basically took Thomas Huxley's message and gobbled it up. And he was his PR agent. And Huxley had like a negative view on the world. So he only promoted that survival of the fittest, natural selection stuff. And he left out what Darwin's real point was, which is where we are finally coming back around to with people like you and your audience and this new wisdom world, which is, dude, it's been about love gratitude, cooperation all along. Wally, the world's been operating for the past 100, 150 years based on a misunderstanding. Mm. Yeah, and you know, that's not too far from exactly what happens today with many messages that are put out. And then, you know, just like Huxley puts it out in his perspective and puts it out, you know, the way he wants to put it out. It's yeah, same, and it becomes like a meme. Yeah, it becomes like a meme exactly. that people just grab onto. Mm-hmm. So what's, what's fascinating is we've been operating, all of our companies, every company has been operating under a misunderstanding. And so this lifter leadership paradigm, basically it resets everything and it demonstrates that lifters, people like you who lift each other up, can simultaneously lift their coworkers through their attitudes, through their positivity, through their cooperation, through, you know, I, I work with so many companies where I would say 70 to 80 percent of the energy in the company is wasted on politics, survival, maneuvering so you can get that promotion, make more money, get that project. And only 20, 30 percent actually goes towards productive, you know, creating new services that serve people, new products. And so this lifter leadership uh, approach at IamALifter.com backslash men of M- MOA um, highlights these four mind shifts. So the first mind shift is the hunt is over. Frankly, there never was supposed to be a hunt. And we teach people specific skills that you can take away right away that help you reset your mindset um, around these new principles. Uh, and we have specific skills. One of them uh, we call word watching. So think about it. If we're using words like hunt customers, capture them, cons- calling people consumers. Hey, Wally, do you like being called a consumer? No, it's, it's gross. It's gross. It's kind of like when we go to the Chinese restaurant with my kids and we're waiting for our appetizers and we're watching the fish in the fish tank. There's those little fish at the bottom that are like sucking all the algae and all the <laughs> crap at the bottom. Like that's a consumer to me. Who wants to be a consumer? So the words we use – Uh, like target, consumer, even the word employees comes from a military mindset. All this stuff is very military-esque, right? War, games, sport, the hunt. And our job is to shift our words from hunt, capture, canvas, analyze, pursue, chase, transact to other words like attract, serve, help, inspire, etc. And the words themselves provide a window into transforming the way we operate our businesses so we can be greater innovators um, and have uh, more customers. So that is one of the mind shifts. And we have four mind shifts that we share um, in the uh, the course that we uh, provide. And you can check out some of them on a TEDx talk on that website. Um, and each of them is very powerful to realign with what you and your audience members really believe in, in a practical way as an employee who wants to be the next level of leadership. Because I'm telling you, lifters objectively are the leaders of the future. They are the best innovators. They're the best leaders. They're the best team players. They're the best ambassadors for your brand. And so if you can create lifters in your company and be a lifter leader, you will solve the things you're struggling with. And we're really excited about that. Man, that sounds super exciting. Well, Paresh, we're at the point of the show. We're going to pay it forward to our abundant leaders. You ready to do that? Happy to do that. Yes. How can I help? Hey, all of you amazing small business owners out there, if you're struggling or if you want to take your business to the next level, I want to help you out. And I want to give you a free five-day sneak peek access to my e-learning platform where there are literally millions of dollars of done-for-you advertising for over 100 different industries. And I want to invite you to my Abundance and Prosperity Mastery Facebook group, where I will be sharing live videos, screen shares of my screen, giving training right there in the group, 
And you may even get a chance to be invited on so that we can evaluate your business and see where we can lift up your business and greatly enhance your marketing and your business strategies. Now, any of you can get access to the Abundance and Prosperity Mastery Group. All you have to do is go to the show notes of this episode, scroll down to the bottom, and request access to the group. Now, if you want the five-day sneak peek to the e-learning platform, where you will not only get access to the millions of dollars of done-for-you marketing, you'll also get a weekly video series laying out a step-by-step plan to a million-dollar business. And in the e-learning platform, you will have the opportunity to fill out a small questionnaire on your business so that you can get access to a step-by-step plan on what you can do to greatly increase the revenue of your business, many times without even taking on any more work. Look, I'm going to share one quick tip for you right now that most business owners just don't get and few people are telling you. Marketing is great and you have to market, but that's a long-term return on investment. If you need immediate revenue in your business, marketing is not going to get that for you. You must implement the business strategies that I share with you within the e-learning platform. Now, access to the e-learning platform is $197 investment a month. And that is chump change compared to the value that you will get out of that e-learning platform. But let me prove it to you. I'm going to give you five days access. All you have to do is get access to the Abundance and Prosperity Mastery Facebook group and invite five of your friends. I'm doing this because I want to grow this group so that more business owners can get access to this information because I will be sharing much of this information right there in the Facebook group as well. And I want to prove to you the value of the e-learning platform. So get access to the Abundance and Prosperity Mastery group, invite five of your friends, and I will give you access to the e-learning platform for five days No credit card, no form of payment whatsoever. I'm just going to give you access. You'll be able to get in there and see the full value of the e-learning platform. Because if I can't show you how to greatly increase your revenue in just five days, I have no business being a business and marketing strategist. I look forward to seeing you in the Abundance and Prosperity Mastery Group and showing off all of the valuable content in the e-learning platform. Now let's get back to the conversation. Well, You have already shared so many amazing uh, strategies, mindset, uh, word, you know, word watching, just amazing things. But if you could share one to three actionable steps that men of abundance can take today. Sure. I've got one that I guarantee you, you're going to get some great feedback on. And please come to IamALifter.com and uh, backslash MOA uh, and just share your stories or share them with Wally. Um, because Someone introduced me to this exercise, and I have given this exercise to hundreds, thousands of uh, uh, students and uh, people that we have trained, and it's it's amazing. So here's what we're going to do. Each of everyone listening right now, grab a piece of paper uh, or a scrap of paper or an envelope or something, and basically draw four columns on it. Okay, and what we're going to name this exercise is the. <clears throat> Good and very good abundance worksheet. The good and very good abundance worksheet. And what this is going to do is you're going to see the good and very good that shows up in your life when you have a mindset of abundance and prosperity. And watch what happens. So what we're going to do is you're going to, on the far left column, put in the date. The next column, you're going to basically write down abundance, what actually happened. The third amount, you're going to... Uh, the third column will be how much money uh, you witnessed showing up. Uh, and the fourth one will I'll discuss in a minute. So this is a proxy, Wally, for abundance, generally speaking. A lot of people mistake abundance strictly and prosperity strictly around financial matters and money. And that's a part of it. There's nothing wrong with money. In fact, everything is right with money. And that's one of the, the mind shifts we need to change in our world is the worthiness, our sovereignty, uh, and our, our us being agents of goodness. And so money is meant to flow through us as us, you know, uh, into, you know, hiring the best people so we can lift more people, um, and having the nice things so that we can live comfortably so we can share. And so basically what we want you to do is have your audience look for the good that is expected and unexpected, the, the unexpected good and very good in their life. And money will be a proxy for relationships abundance, for health abundance, 
for professional abundance, whatever you want there to be abundance in, the money will be a symbol of it through this exercise. So what you're going to do is you're going to go through the world with this little piece of paper in your pocket or your wallet, etc., and you're just going to watch for the good and unexpected good that just shows up in your life, the prosperity that shows up. You might find a nickel on the sidewalk. By the way, you, your folks are going to start finding money everywhere, so trust me. And so you're going to basically say, okay, today is today's date, and then you're going to write down five cents in the second column. And then, uh, or you're going to say, you know, found money on the sidewalk. Then you're going to write down five cents. Okay. Then you may have a friend. While you go, hey, Paresh, you want to go to lunch? I'll buy you lunch. Guess what? Is that prosperity and abundance, Wally? Absolutely. So you're going to say, you know what? $38. My friend bought me lunch in the second column. Lunch, $38. You're going to basically... Have, I've got students who, within 24 hours, sometimes get checks for thousands of dollars, which is really – I love this when it happens because it's not me that's doing this. It's the world of abundance that's showing up that's already there. I had a student just last week. I gave her this. She found $12,000, she and her husband, unexpectedly um, in some tax stuff that they totally didn't think they were going like, to – it didn't even – it didn't even exist until the next day where they found an error that was $12,000. So what you're going to do is your team, your listeners are going to go through the world for a week with this piece of paper, and they're going to keep track of the good and unexpected good that's showing up. There may be a parking meter that's full, and you're going to calculate, wow, someone already put in a buck fifty. So you're going to say this date, parking meter, buck fifty. And the mindset that we're going to use here, Wally, for you and your wonderful audience, thank you all for listening to this because we need good men of abundance who don't have this poverty consciousness, dog eat dog, I am a hunter and it's all about me attitude. People think that's what being a man is. No more, my friends. And so what you want to do is just look for the treasures. They are everywhere and, it's, and see it as a treasure hunt. And the other thing I really want you guys to understand is the difference between expectations and expectancy. It's a very important distinction. So you don't want to walk away saying, I expect X, Y, and Z to happen because then we get attached to an outcome. What we want to do is have a joyful expectancy, right? We talked about Disneyland and it's like, oh boy, there's going to be so much fun here. Like, where's the treasure going to be? How's it going to show up? It's kind of like your birthday. You know, great things are going to happen. You know, you're going to get gifts, but you don't know exactly what they are. Unless you peeked on, you know, the Amazon list, list that your parents, you know, clicked on. But that's a separate <laughs> story. So basically, you're going to go through and look for treasures all around you and look for the good and unexpected good, the good and very good in your life. And look for it with a sense of expectancy, a joyful. I know it's out there. You know, Paresh and Wally talked about this. This works. <clears throat> Just keep your eyes open. And, and what you're going to do is you're going to write down the date, what happened. I got a check for you know $1,200 unexpected from something from years ago. I've got students who get a – I had one got a check for like $6,000 from an employer 10 years ago that said, oh, by the way, we owe you some money. Boom. And like she had no idea. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take 10% of that in that last column and you're going to give it away so that the circulation continues. Okay, so let's say that you ended up, you know, getting uh, you go go to buy something in a store and that's on sale. How often does this happen? Wow, this is a great deal. It's 40 percent off. And you go to the counter and go, Mr. Shaw, there's an additional 20 percent off. It's like, whoa, really? You write that down as your unexpected good. And then you give away 10 percent to charity, to goodness, to something and watch what happens. Please report back to me because the miracles that you will see and your audience will see from this exercise are unbelievable. And I didn't believe this until I did this myself. I do it frequently. So it's your good and unexpected good, the treasure hunt. That is your actionable step for men of abundance today. Just do it. Do it for a week and watch what starts happening. You're going to start seeing money show up in your life. Pennies on the sidewalk. People buying you free stuff. You're going to go to a a cafe somewhere and you're going to say, oh, you know what? I forgot to buy a drink. I'd like to buy it. And the person is going to say, you know what? Just keep it. Don't worry about it. And big things will happen. People are going to get new jobs and they're going to report back to you. They're going to get raises. There's going to be 
you know, vacations that they didn't think that their boss was going to give them. These are all treasures and the expectancy showing up in real life. So that is the uh, actionable pay it forward step. And I want to hear your stories because there's not there's no greater turn on than people sharing their stories and going, I didn't believe this stuff. And my God, it worked because believe it or not. I was one of those, Wally. I didn't believe in any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. I was a non-believer, and I will declare that, a non-believer. And now I am all in, and the universe is taking me all around the world to work with leaders, to make them lifter leaders, because that's what the world needs, is people who lift their coworkers, their community, their company, and their customers simultaneously. And that's the power of Lifter Leadership. We're not just doing these little one-ofs, like, hey, we want to be innovators. Hey, we need to find a way to engage our workers because they're lazy and unentitled, uh, and they're entitled. No, Lifter Leadership solves for this. One of the things I talk about is, you know, so many of my CEOs I work with, you know, complain about, oh, these millennials today, they're lazy and entitled and they're job hoppers and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, you are leading them with like 1920s leadership technology. It's like you're giving them, you know, an a Apple II Plus in a world where they need a brand new Mac to do their work. Of course, they're not going to be, you know, fully engaged and care. But if you give these young people a purpose that they really believe in, which is what Lifter Leadership is about. You demonstrate positivity and the optimism that you and I talked about in our conversation about you know, Mickey Mouse and, and the Merlin Mickey. You be positive, you give them purpose, you give them a sense of honor and to be creatively self-expressed and honor their diversity. You demonstrate what authenticity really is because today's workers have a bullshit meter that is a thousand times stronger than earlier generations. I know my kids do. Mm -hmm. And so if if you are a CEO uh, or even a worker who's like, hey, you know what? Here's our little Instagram of our CEO with a poor little girl in Africa because we give money to, you know, clean water for wells. But then your same company is dumping toxic waste somewhere else in the world, or you have unethical labor, manufacturing practices somewhere, today's workers smell that. They don't even need to research it on the internet. They smell it in your tone and in your vibration, in your energetic field, which is what we talk about when I teach yoga. And they're like, you are so full of crap. Why should I give you my all? You're, you're a hypocrite. And so when we demonstrate lifter leadership of authenticity and integrity, creativity, purpose, positivity, the things that we train it in the I am a lifter dot uh, uh, workshops, which your audience, we're going to give your, your guys, Wally, a special uh, deal on that because you guys are going to pay it forward so much more than most. So we're going to have to work that out. Um, magic happens. And these people will walk on fire for you. If you line up the way to lead them with lifter leadership, they will be great innovators. They'll solve problems. Your customers will love them. They will trust them and they will recruit better people to work for you. So that is um, what lifter leadership does is it basically solves for this um, complaint that people have, which is ill-informed and frankly, it is unfair. It's unfair because we grew up in the work your ass off, save a bunch of money, suck it up for your boss, don't speak up, you're lucky you have a job because you know what, there may not be money, you got to save money because something can go wrong and you got to hoard it. That is the poverty consciousness that we are breaking out of. Are we not men? Yes, we are. And so shifting into this lifter leadership paradigm as a leader, whether you are a a receptionist you can be a lifter leader think of the receptionist who lift the hundreds of people who come to work every day and put them into a better state of being so they can be more productive they can be more innovative so lifters don't have to be ceos vps or anything lifter leadership applies anywhere they're everyday ordinary leaders you could be a waitress and be a lifter leader and these people are objectively based on my team's research the future leaders and part of um, the analogy that we use, uh, Wally, and I'll kind of wrap it up, is we've gone through different evolutions as a planet, 
And there have been certain people who have been the rock stars who have taken humanity to a whole new level, who have taken businesses to a whole new level over the course of time. And I talk about this on in my TEDx talk uh, if you go to IamALifter.com. And what you'll see is, for instance, there was a time when you and I pretty much all day would have been farming because it was a world where every family had their own little farm. It was called subsistence farming. And we basically have to farm all day to maybe have enough food so we don't starve. And then a couple of non-obvious innovators, farmers, said, hey, let's try it a different way. Why don't we move the soybeans to where the corn was and move the corn where your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents have always planted it. Let's move the corn to over to where the grain was. And they started doing crop rotation and understanding seeds and paying attention to weather patterns. And they created a whole new world with mass scale manufacturing and the agricultural revolution. And they basically found a way to feed people like humans could never conceive before like the idea of an all-you-can-eat buffet at Olive Garden which we go to as a family was not even an idea in people's heads back then so those guys were the rock stars and they created the agricultural revolution they created a whole new world where people could do different things so then what happened was people went into the cities because they now had time because they weren't farming all day and so what happened next the industrial revolution so if you were someone who could automate work processes and basically slip into this new paradigm, which people like Henry Ford, non-obvious thinkers invented around the use of steam power and automation and you know uh, work time motion studies, you were a rock star. And those people who understood what was happening with mass scale manufacturing created the industrial revolution. And those companies became the mega companies who ran the world, Rockefeller, Carnegie, uh, etc. So then what so those guys were the rock stars of the industrial revolution. Then what came next? The nerds and the geeks, right? They led the information revolution, the internet revolution, which gave us things we couldn't even imagine before. Like I could hear a song in the distance and I could basically pull up my phone, hit a button on my Shazam app, boom, and instantly I have that song in the palm of my hand. I can share it with Wally, even if he's on another side of the world, and we can experience that. So in that world, the nerds and the geeks were the rock stars, and they created the companies that basically run the world right now. So the companies who understood, hey, there's these weirdos. They're called nerds and geeks. They talk about this weird stuff like computers and TCP IP, and we don't understand them. They're kind of weird, and they hang out in weird circles um, talking about weird stuff. But – I think what they know is important, and even though we don't understand this, we need to bring them in and let them flourish, let them do their thing. Those companies basically run the world right now. Well, guess what, Wally and Wally's folks? We've now entered the fourth evolution, and this is now a revolution of creativity, caring, cooperation, the interconnectedness of everything like we just talked about as an energetic system, compassion, cooperation, caring, creativity. And it's a new revolution of consciousness, consciousness. And Wally, you heard it here. I'm telling you that lifters are the new nerds and geeks. They're the new rock stars in this new era of consciousness. And I'm telling you right now that this new evolution, revolution from the agrarian to the industrial to the information to this revolution of consciousness is bigger than the Internet. And the lifters are the new nerds and geeks. So if you guys want to be the rock stars for this new period of humanity, then you know, listen to people like Wally. Embrace the teachings of abundance. Pay it forward. Servant leadership. And uh, we're here to help you. So come to IamALifter.com backslash uh, MOA for Men of Abundance. Um, check out my TEDx talk. Uh, I think that will be helpful to you all. And we're here to be helpful in any way. There's a diagnostic uh, that we have to see what you know. Where are you on the lifter scale, and what areas might you need to work on to get into this new way of thinking? Because I tell you, a lot of companies are still operating in that old Darwinian mistaken way, and lifters get it. And more and more companies around the world, just as you're seeing, Wally, are saying, "This is it. This is what we need." And I've had government officials in the Middle East saying, "Yes, Mr. Shaw, this is what we need. We need more compassion. We need more creativity." And I even talk about things like the divine feminine. 
skills, which we all have. When I teach yoga, we all have masculine, feminine energy, and it's really a rebalancing now from that masculine, practical, analytic, go solve it right now, you know, technical left brain, which has really ruled us in business and society and organizations. We're now seeing a re-leveling of things that have traditionally been known as feminine skills, compassion, creativity, nurturing, patience, intuition, and the, your listeners who get this will be the rock stars. I'm telling you that. Well, I'm just sitting here soaking it all up, man, because this right here, I, I am truly the blessed man, one of the most blessed men in the world, because I get to listen to these amazing conversations, have these conversations, interact with it. But I just soaking it all up. I absolutely love it. Everything you just said is just amazing. And I really look forward to getting a hold of your book as well. Um, yeah, that'll be coming out in the first quarter. Have your folks uh, um, come to the website and just drop their name in. We're going to get your folks a free excerpt from the book. Uh, it's at the publisher right now. It's being edited. It's going to come out the first quarter of next year. And we're going to give you guys a free, uh, some free sneak, pick, sneak peeks into the book, some excerpts. Uh, you got my TEDx talk. We have a diagnostic to see what's your lifter potential. Is your company a lifter leader company? Because I tell you, just like total quality was a big thing a way back, uh, lifter leadership is the new paradigm that every company needs to embrace, or it will be like you missed the internet. It will be like you missed the internet. Yeah, we're, and we're definitely going to have all that linked up. Everything that Parash has just mentioned, we're going to have it all linked up in the show notes, so don't worry about writing anything down, guys. We'll have it all there. And, uh, man, what an amazing, amazing uh, information you've shared and the knowledge and the wisdom. It's just amazing. I have two more questions for you real quick. And uh, real quick, Wally, I yeah. just want to say it's not mine. It just comes through. When we become attuned as lifters, we know what we need to share. And so I, I'm not taking credit for this. It's all a matter of attunement to what is truth. And that truth comes through for whatever we are about. So if you are a musician, that truth will come through in your music. If you are a you know, a, a coach or a trainer, it'll come through for that. If you are a, a teacher, it'll come through for that. If you're a parent. So it's really a question of attunement. So I just want you to know this isn't me. I'm just a vessel. We're all vessels. And, you know, we take our freakishness, our unique, authentic self, which is ultimately what we're here to be and express and align it with what truth is around what we're passionate about. And for me, it's about creating jobs and creating opportunity for people and, and having people have hope and, and the well-being and happiness in their lives. You know, so what, what were you, yeah, no, what were I appreciate questions? you saying that. And that's re very important that you bring that out because going back to real quick about what you were talking about in reference to being grateful. And then you were talking about the, um, the exercise, uh, the activity. And I absolutely love that activity. I've never heard of it put that way, but everybody knows anybody who's been following my show and following me for any time, you know, any amount of time knows where the whole abundance mindset came from for me. And it was basically that activity without actually doing the activity. And once I made the realization that I need to be grateful for everything that I have right now, and I just realized how much abundance is in my life, just yep. exactly like you said would happen, Paresh, all of this stuff. I started getting introductions to people that I wanted to exactly. talk to, that introduced exactly. me to this, that helped me write my book, that helped me do exactly. And here's one thing I want to point out, though. Along yeah. the way, uh, doing this, starting this about three years, four years ago now, along the way, it kind of got, I kind of got back into the old who I was. And mm -hmm. I realized not as much was being presented to me. It's always there, <laughs> but not as much exactly. was being presented to me. Exactly. And you, you just completely it. reinvigorated. Now, here I am. I left Hawaii and I'm, I'm here and I'm living this amazing life on purpose. But still... I haven't seen all of these abundance of, you know, well, I got to actually admit, like three weeks ago, I received a $280 check in the mail that I did not expect. It came from a product that somebody mentioned on one of my shows like three months ago. And literally yep. a check just showed up in my in my mailbox. I was like, dude, that's right on time. I didn't, I had no idea. Right you know, so on It's time. there, but I, you just need to practice this stuff, guys. And that activity, I'm going to do it. 
and remind each other right. when we slip back into the old model of, oh, I got to hustle, man, and, mm -hmm. and man, I got to work my butt off. I got to go chase. I got to chase the bacon, man. I got to chase it. I'm the provider. And a lot of men have this provider mindset. I know mm -hmm. I do. I'm the provider. Mm -hmm. I got to hustle. I got to – people are counting on me. And you know what? This other way is so much easier. So much, so much easier. You know, and by the way, you don't sit on your ass, mm -hmm. just so you know. The, the fourth lifter mind shift, so we have four lifter mind shifts you'll see um, in, in the, the materials. The first one is the hunt is over, is the first mind shift. The second one is called truth or consequences, which gets into you must be authentic and have integrity. And we give you very specific skills to go, where are we on that and how do we do that? The third lifter mind shift we say is lifters are yes and people. It used to be that they'd say, hey, are you good with numbers or – are you a creative person or are you a salesperson? And you have to box yourself in. And lifters basically operate at that intersection we talked about before. We may call ourselves freaks, but lifters say, yeah, I am that and that and that. And that's mm -hmm. what makes me unique and a, and, a, and a unique contribution to the world. So that's the third mind shift in the lifter leadership uh, training and book and paradigm that we are sharing with organizations around the world. And the fourth lifter mind shift is called lifters take invictus action. Okay, we don't just sit on our butt waiting for money to rain down from heaven. We we know when do we move? When when do we take action? When do we follow up? When do we trust our instinct to go? You know what? Let me have a conversation with that person over there. Some I don't know what it is, but let me see if I can be helpful to that person. And then using that guidance, that person may end up becoming you're right that next client or that next support for whatever or that next relationship you're looking for. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Ac action is one of my favorite words. In fact, one of my, I think I'm the only one that does this hashtag. I hashtag almost everything I do. And when I share a video that I love, it's hashtag abundance in action because it's there you all go. about action. Exactly. So do the exercise, everybody. I, I would love to see how many thousands of dollars or tens of thousands or maybe even higher your audience reports back. Uh, to you, Wally, let me know because um, I'm a bit I'm a bit of a betting man, uh, <laughs> and I uh, I like to go to Vegas every now and then. I don't play big money, but it's fun. Um, and I tell you, I bet you your your audience is going to come up with so many stories to share within the next week that it, that people will believe because I didn't believe this until I saw it myself. Because again, I'm an analytical. I want data, man. I'm an engineer. I'm a I'm a return on investment financial guy too. And this was beautiful because a return on investment, like what is the denominator when all you have to do is pay attention and have a joyful, where's it going to be attitude? Like what's the investment? Nothing. And what's the return? Thousands of dollars mm -hmm. or relationships or contacts or clients or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. You know, I get contacted on a regular basis. Uh, about, you know, people want me to invest in this and invest in that. And, you know, it can be anything from Forex to Bitcoin, you name it. And they always ask me, what do you invest in? And I tell them, I invest in myself. And if I'm going to put money into anything, I invest into companies that I personally know. But investing yep. in myself and investing in others is the part I missed. I invest in myself and I invest in others. And that can be time, money, time, treasures, or talents. I but love it. Yes. That. Every and the return on investment is just so freaking huge. It's more than monetary. Don't get me wrong, guys. You know I like making money, but yep. it, the money will come. It's the right. way I feel. It's what I do for other people. It's when I introduce I, somebody just recently, literally contacted me this week asking me for a big favor. They got a big issue going on in their lives, and I said, "Look, I'm not the one you need to talk to about that. Here's two guys I know that you can call and talk to. I'll have them contact you." And it did. They yep. did. They contacted him, and it just made. I got this huge thank you note, you know. And it's just the way you do things, you know. Yep, yep. Yeah. It's it's beautiful. So if we can be of any help to you or your listeners, we are here for you, um, men. I'm telling you, we need to get over this men crap, and um, you know, move into the slipstream of what Wally's talking about, which is. You know, it's, it's kind of a different world than we've been – many of us were raised to be and we're supposed to be strong and hustlers and hunters and sportsmen and, you know, and we need to shift that. And I'm telling you, particularly in this, you know, world where there's this whole, you know, kind of tension between men and women and all this hashtagging going on, the men who get this first, there's no doubt 
like you're you, the sky is the limit for you in whatever you pursue because this also solves for a lot of what's happening in terms of the conflict between men and women. It's these mindsets and these mind shifts are opposed to one another. And this lifter leadership uh, framework and mind shift basically reconciles it all in a way that works for everyone, men, women, children, schools, teachers, governments, companies, small, large. And it's uh, it's a really a beautiful gift. So we're here to help you all. And, um, you know, it's part of my company, um, which is called the non-obvious company, um, because we believe that the only way to solve the biggest problems in the world for our children, for ourselves and for 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 humanity is through non-obvious thinking. And so my broader mission in life and lifter leadership is kind of non-obvious when you think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we help companies innovate in non-obvious ways, new products, new services, new experiences, new ways to you know, uh, recruit, maintain, motivate your workers, build trust. And so lifter leadership is a non-obvious way of leading. And trust me, you know, uh, from someone who's, you know, quite passionate about innovation, strategy and leadership um, from the non-obvious company perspective, lifter leadership is what you need to learn. You don't even need to get an MBA, guys. Anyone who's thinking about getting an MBA, you can. But let me tell you, become a lifter leader and you may not even need to get an MBA because many of the MBA schools are still teaching the old model. This is the new cutting edge way to be. It's like the internet is happening all over again. So who wouldn't want to be in on the ground floor? And certainly, who would want to miss out on the internet happening if you could be on the ground floor? And that's basically what's happening with this new revolution of consciousness, pay it forward, servant uh, leadership, uh, kind of framework around abundance versus scarcity. And lifter leadership, uh, to me, is such a joy to be a, a, a vessel of bringing to the world because there isn't a, a integrated system like a seven habit system that brings it all together in a way that works for innovation, engagement, building trust, getting more customers, along with, you know, feeling good about oneself. And that's what this model um, you know, really is here to uh, help you all with. So uh, I love you guys. I love the fact that there are men listening to Wally uh, around issues that historically were kind of more touchy feely and, you know, not so manly. Um, because I tell you, the men who get this um, are the supermen. We're the supermen. And if you, you know, we talked about money as abundance, uh, men who are looking for relationships. Let me tell you guys, whether it's money or not, you can put the money aside. You can even have your own little worksheet to see how many amazing people you meet, men, women, etc., in terms of new relationships. The same mindset works for healing, if you have some sort of healing you need, for relationships, for money, and other things. Abundance is everywhere. It's just in front of us. So let us know what comes of your you know, good and very good, unexpected good and very good worksheets. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll be praying for you guys that, that you get it faster than I did because it took me many decades to get this. And this is the way it works. Well, absolutely. Guys, you have a big, big head start on the both of us, depending on where you're at in life. Paresh, I greatly appreciate this conversation again, the wisdom and um, everything that you shared with us here today. And, Again, just go out and live your life of abundance, man, and keep paying it forward because I just know it's making a huge difference. You bet. All the best and keep lifting. All right, guys, your action step for today is very, very simple. Just lift up one other person. Just one other person. Find somebody who either you know or don't know and figure out a way to lift them up. Have a conversation with them. Maybe give them a couple dollars for a meal. Maybe take them out to have coffee and have a conversation with them or to lunch and have a conversation with them. Figure out a way to lift somebody up today, some way, somehow. And if you really need some ideas on how to lift somebody else up, then go back and listen to this conversation again. And go to IamALifter.com and let Paresh share some more ideas with you through his videos and through the content there at that website. Now, go out and live your life of abundance, and make sure to pay it for it. 
That's all for today, Abundance Leaders. For more about our guests and the powerful information we shared with you today, be sure to sign up for our mailing list at menofabundance.com. We appreciate your time and look forward to hanging out with you on our next episode. So until then, be sure to pay it forward and live your life of abundance.